Uh, it is such a pleasure to see you all here in person again. Uh, it has been two years uh, since we've been here. Uh, in fact, three years for me since I missed the 2020 Forum. Um, while we're getting the next panel going, uh, I want to talk about the publication that you have at your seats, the, the Global Energy Agenda. This is a publication we started last year, um, published the second edition this year, and in it we have a collection of essays that set the scene for the energy year. Now we published this in January uh, during uh, what was supposed to be the, the forum. Uh, we did a, a couple of virtual events during Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. Um, and so this may seem a bit out of date at times, given how, the, how much the world has changed since January. But I just reread the whole thing on the flight over. So much of it is still prescient and relevant. So I really want to encourage you all to read it and share it with your colleagues. And I want to thank all of the authors in this room who have contributed essays both this year and last year. Um, as we're getting set up, I want to introduce uh, our good friend, Hadley Gamble, to the stage. Hadley will be moderating our next panel, which is called Meeting the 2022 Energy Challenge. Will energy security derail energy transition? And I'd like to welcome our panelists to the stage. We have uh, Mr. Majid Jaffer, the CEO of Crescent Petroleum. Majid, always a pleasure. Thank you. You've been here every single year. We have Tim Holt, uh, member of the executive board and labor director of Siemens Energy. Um, we have uh, uh, Mr. Fahad Alajlan, the president of the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies uh, and Research Center. Um, we have uh, Anna Spitzberg, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Transformation. And finally, we have Mr. Claudio Descalzi, uh, the CEO of ENI. So thank you all so much for being here today. Hadley, over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Randy. And um, I want to say thank you so much uh, to Dubai Expo and to the UAE, Your Excellencies, Fred, um, Randy, for allowing me to, to be a part of this incredible forum. And at no time, frankly, um, are the things that we are going to be talking about been more relevant and, and right up my alley, I have to say. Panelists, welcome. It's great to see everybody. Um, I have been running around for the last several months uh, from Russia to Ukraine, as well as to Brussels. Um, I feel like I don't even know where I am anymore. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Antalya for the first level, high level round of talks between the foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine. So I've been able to get a real sense, both um, behind the scenes and speaking to world leaders, the Chancellor of Germany last week, the French President last week, and as well, um, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the NATO Secretary General. So I'm looking at this as we all are from all different angles. As His Excellency Suhail Masrui so uh, uh, rightly put it, this is a geopolitical crisis, this is an energy crisis. I want to kick off um, by asking uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State to walk us through the role right now of the United States, because how can you possibly ask this part of the world to commit to more production, putting more oil on the table, putting more gas on the table, when at the same point you are abandoning them to Houthi attacks, both on Aramco infrastructure and even on infrastructure in Abu Dhabi, because you can't have it both ways. Thank you for that question. The administration's policy from the beginning was always energy security, energy access, and decarbonization across the board. The, the focus on energy security and everything that's happening right now that we need to respond as a result of Russian aggression in Ukraine is something we have to manage. We have never said that near-term security is some, energy security is something that does not need to be at forefront and center as we transition. So the request on production increases is something to meet demands today that we understand 80% of our energy system is carbon intensive. We do not turn off that switch. We say that all the time and we say it for a reason because it's a reality. But we are dealing in, in not just times where we have uncertainty because of the geopolitics, we have uncertainty because we don't have a playbook for an economic recovery off of COVID. Demand has been a roller coaster. There hasn't been signals for long-term investing and contracting for a number of reasons. Those signals need to make sense to meet the market today, but we do not walk away from the energy transition while we're doing it. We can't, we don't have that option. It is essentially like getting into the middle of a street and thinking we're not gonna get hit when the light turns red. We don't have that option. We need to do both of these things. 
We do, though, very much are paying attention to what is happening geopolitically, including the impacts that we saw in the CPC pipeline in Kazakhstan. The Houthi attacks, of course, make a difference. We do not support any aggression, and we stand with our allies and partners on this. One of the big questions, of course, is who's backing the Houthis? And we're talking about the Iranian Revolutionary yeah. Guard. And right now, there is a conversation, a very real one, happening in Washington. It's also happening in Europe about what the JCPOA, the next generation of that deal, could potentially look like and removing the Iranian Revolutionary Guard from the list of terror groups. Does that not present a conflict of interest? With our goals, no, I do not think it presents a conflict of interest in terms of making sure that we remove rebel groups and that we secure infrastructure while we move toward our goals now. I could ask you about the Patriot missiles, but I'll move on. Um, Claudio Descalzi, fantastic to have you, sir. I just sat on a panel in Doha with Patrick Poyani, the CEO of Total Energies, and I pressed him on the idea that he has refused technically to exit their investments in Russia. He says, we're not buying any more Russian oil. He said, but we can't get rid of these assets, essentially, because we can't write them off, because we don't want that money to go to, potentially, the Russian government or oligarchs. He's like, that would only hurt the effort that we're making at this point to stay in line with sanctions. Walk us through what's happening today with any. Are you still purchasing Russian oil? Can you confirm to us that that is not still the case? And also, what you're doing with regards to the government specifically in terms of those conversations about what needs to happen toward the transition and to wean Italy specifically off of Russian sources of energy. So, thank you for the opportunity to talk about Russia. Uh, no, we don't, our position, Russia is very marginal, it's not material. We just have a, a pipeline from uh, Russia to Turkey, Blue Stream. And a uh, few days after the war started, uh, I announced that we dismissed this activity. And then uh, we have an uh, upstream joint venture with Ro uh, Rosneft, but uh, ev everything is sanctioned and frozen uh, starting 2014. So that remained the case. So we don't have. The only big issue is that uh, as other companies in Europe, we buy gas. So we don't have asset there, we don't have investment, we don't have project. Uh, the issue is gas. And now uh, that they ask us to pay in uh, ruble, uh, it, it, it became very difficult to buy it, to pay it, because we just we don't have. <laughs> and it's not in, cont in, the, in the contract, because the contract is written euro, and uh, you cannot change you uni unilaterally. So you have to agree on this change is difficult to agree because we don't have this kind of currency so uh, that is the only big question and that is the, the reason of the volatility uncertainties and that is the reason why the gas price in spite of the mild weather in spite that we have LNG in spite that is we have gas now because also the Russian gas is coming the price is very high is at least seven seven times more, eight times more than what it was uh, uh, three years ago or in the last five years. So the situation is that, so we don't have assets, we don't have uh, big, uh, no, we don't have uh, any kind of investment. Uh, the gas issue is a is big issue. It's, flo it's flowing now, it's flowing, it's arriving from Ukraine to Italy uh, at the moment. Uh, we don't know what happened in the future, honestly. Yeah, so no Russian rubles for Russian gas. Sorry? So no Russian rubles for Russian gas. Yeah. yeah. Walk me through, though, those conversations that you are no doubt having with Mario Draghi about how to wean the country off of dependency on Russian sources of energy and at the same point um, have a realistic dialogue about the level of investment that is needed going forward towards the energy transition as well as making sure that there is a sustainable market of energy in the near term. So I think that's also the, the minister said clearly that in the last years, in the past, uh, we create a, a conflict between energy transition and gas or oil and decarbonization. We came in an ideology, so just renewables. We are producing a lot of renewables. We know that we cannot do everything with just with the renewables. There are a lot of different technologies, but, uh, you know, gas until two months ago in Europe, the taxonomy 
gas was out in November, October. They, uh, you know, I don't want to say that you are a criminal if you produce gas or oil, but not far to be a criminal case if you are producing gas or oil. And now, so that is a big mistake to be radical and say, I want just that, renewables, and the rest have to disappear. We know very well that in the last 200 years, all the different energy vectors has been added. So coal plus oil plus gas and plus renewable. There, we, never, we never found a source or energy source that replaced everything. It's, it's crazy to think that there is something that can replace everything. For that reason, the transition, we have to accept that we have some infrastructure for what we spend billion and billion that are hard to abate, so we have to capture, and we need to use all the different technologies. If we think that uh, we have to choose some uh, technology by an ideological approach, it's crazy. Technology is neutral. There is no religion. It's not a god, a technology. You have to use to f face the transition. So I think that uh, when we talk about energy, first of all, we have to know what you are talking about, so competencies. Everybody talk about energy, Every talk about, everybody talk about COVID and make a big confusion and they create a big mistake and now we see what happened. It's not just Russia, the gas price is not just Russia because for seven years we underinvested, we invested just 45% of what we invested in the previous seven years until 2014. Then we have Russia, then we have COVID. So I think that uh, the worldwide leadership was not wise and, and without any equilibrium in evaluate the energy situation. Do you think worry you, um, this historic agreement that the Biden administration has cut with Europe, does it worry you in terms of getting extra supplies of gas to Europe? Where's that gas gonna come from? because there are already long-term contra contracts uh, coming from Qatar. I was just speaking with the Qatar energy minister about this a couple of days ago. And then we think about what's happening with U.S. production as well. Where is that going to come from to make up that shortfall? Are they realistic, do you think? I don't know. I didn't talk about that with the uh, U.S. And <laughs> so maybe you know better than me. Clearly, if you had to replace 160 billion cubic meter uh, it's not, uh, uh, per, per year, it's not, it's not an easy task. Uh, we don't have enough LNG, first of all. We are still a spare capacity in the north of Europe because we are two Europe's, north and south. South is gas and LNG. North, we have nuclear, coal, wind, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the regasifier. But we still have a 30, 30 billion of spare capacity in the existing regasifiers. If 160 billion disappear, uh, these 30 billion can, cannot replace, and from where they come. You know, the situation is, until two months ago, nobody talked about gas, and for seven, eight years. So how you can start overnight in a business that is a long term, and uh, you say, we need 160 billion, I, and how you can do? In the south, I talk about Italy, we have pipes. So we have Algeria, we have Libya, we have Egypt, we have Congo, we have Mozambique. So the south is more connected with the south, but Europe never thought to be connected with Africa. Europe is an empty box in terms of energy. We don't have our own energy. In the US, you have energy and the good market. In, in Europe, we have a good market, but without energy. And we never thought about uh, a strategy about energy security. Yeah. So when you don't have something, you have to think about what you can, you know, cope with the future. Africa is the only answer at the moment. U.S. can be, but U.S. Uh, has a 120, 100 billion already committed. They can develop more. I don't know, maybe yes, I don't know the situation, but it's not enough. Yeah. Africa is a good opportunity because they need development. We need uh, gas. And that is a good combination, but must be fair. Yeah. So if we take something, we have to give something. Yeah. 
Um, Majid, I want you to come in on that one especially. I mean, where, first of all, the question, where is that guess going to come from? And also, um, the failure of policymakers, frankly. Yeah, so, no, I agree with Claudio. If we go back to the question, the title of the session, will energy security derail the energy transition? Again, there's been this sense that the two are somehow in opposition, and you're seeing that in the media today. Of course, they're not. There, there can be no energy transition without energy security and affordability, uh, as we heard. And the focus has been too much on supply. You know, how do we starve supply? Uh, you know, as if starving investment uh, into oil and gas is going to solve uh, climate change while demand keeps growing. Of course it's not. I mean, that's as ridiculous as trying to solve obesity by starving funding to sugar and wheat farmers uh, and not making any changes in diets or, 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 or policies of how food is consumed. Climate change is fundamentally a consumption uh, uh, issue. Uh, so the wrong focus has, has been there uh, throughout. Another um, key focus that's been missing, and it was good to hear Dr. Sultan speaking about the plans for COP28, is the developing world perspective. Uh, we have almost a billion people without electricity. That number has unfortunately gone up during COVID. Three billion people without clean cooking solutions. It's actually killed more people during the COVID pandemic than COVID itself, according to the World Health Organization. 80% of the world's yet to even get on uh, a plane. And yet the kind of platitudes and prescriptions that have been coming out of Western governments to Africa, uh, Asia, the developing countries is, you don't need stable grid uh, power like we have it. You can make do with a solar panel and a battery. Well, what's happened? There's been more burning of coal. So actually, you're having more emissions and higher energy prices. So this issue of the underinvestment has been key. And it cannot just be, as, as Minister Suhail uh, Mazruri said earlier, it can't be, yes, yes, we need more oil and gas, but just in the very short term. Oil and gas is not a short-term business. It requires hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, as we heard, as a deficit of $200 billion, and it's long-term. So recognizing uh, the importance of that. Now, it will be produced cleaner, it has to be, and it will be used differently. But gas is a fundamental enabler of renewables because it backs it up because it's intermittent and it's the path to future technologies like uh, uh, hydrogen. And oil, even if we're having electric vehicles, they're made of oil. The solar panels are made of oil. Uh, wind turbines are made of oil. Everything we've relied on during uh, COVID, from masks to sanitizers, every single vaccine has had glycol as a stabilizing agent, another oil product. That message has not been understood, in particular in, in, in Western markets, the ongoing need for uh, oil and gas. Now, how we produce it, we as Crescent, we've, over 50 years, we've migrated now to 85% natural gas. We've brought down our emissions, flaring to practically zero. We've offset the, the rest to achieve and declare net zero last year, not in 2050. Uh, but even more importantly is the benefit of the product. So the gas we produce in the Middle East by displacing liquid fuels like diesel for power generation avoids more CO2 emissions annually than all the Teslas on the planet. Uh, and that fact is, is, is underappreciated, the important role of natural gas uh, displacing coal in a lot of Western economies and in Asia and in our region here in the Middle East, uh, liquid fuels. So those facts really need to be better appreciated. We're, we're having this schizophrenia in, 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 in many Western governments. And I commend the UAE's policy, the strategy for 2050 that the minister talked about, because it's very, very clear. It's about 40% gas backed up with, uh, backing up 40% renewables, plus nuclear and other clean technologies. Energy has to be long-term, clear, strategic thinking, not flip-flopping with the latest technology trend or geopolitical event. I want to bring you in on that. I want to bring you in on that, Tim, specifically, because when you think about what happens next with regards to the transition, that's the fundamental question. Does this derail the transition in your mind? Um, I don't think it derails the transition. I think it accelerates the transition. And, uh, you know, we had talks also with the, um, the German Minister of Economy 
and climate action, and he clearly said stronger focus on renewables, stronger focus on hydrogen. I think it's now what's the alternative? Everybody's looking at how can we substitute the Russian gas, LNG, the re gas is one, but the other one is push harder on the energy transition. I will caution so a bit. Um, it's always easy to set more aggressive targets. We need more renewables. The question is, how do we get it done? And I think that's, that's a big question we all need to answer. Um, you know, sometimes I hear we need the technology, we need the financing. My view on it is we have a lot of the ingredients, it's just the implementation. And if you just look at implementation times, um, take the U.S. offshore, we're talking about it until we see until we see the first green kilowatt hour produced, will be probably 2030. We, the huge build out on the offshore in Europe. It's great, it's up in the, in the North Sea. How do we get it to the load centers, transmission lines? Um, we're building a big HVDC line from Northern Germany to Southern Germany where the load is. Three years delay just due to permitting. I think there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. And if you really wanna accelerate the energy transition, I think the focus should also be how do we take this inefficiencies out of the system and how do we really, um, really, instead of opening up additional topics, how do we just focus on the, on the pure get it done, get all the stakeholders together and get it done, and that will buy us time to do the longer term transition topics. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, a general theme that we were hearing earlier from His Excellency talking about um, OPEC is not a political organization, echoing Mr. Barkindo um, in his comments obviously last night talking about we have to find a way to stabilize the market in spite of the fact that we're working with two countries under sanctions, um, the importance of, of taking the politics out of the conversation. But it's impossible to do that, especially when you're a journalist, I think. Fahad, walk me through, in your view, how realistic it is um, for Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and other Gulf producers um, to, uh, I suppose, talk to the Biden administration. You're sitting here on a stage with a member of that team now, and there have been multiple calls from Washington for OPEC Plus uh, to do more, for OPEC to do more, uh, to alleviate the pain at the pump, if you will, in the United States, because they're not talking about the European gas crisis back at home. They are talking about oil inching to $5 a gallon. Is it realistic in your view for Saudi Arabia to help the Biden team out? Uh, thank you, Hadley. Uh, first, let me state that uh, King Abdullah Petroleum Center for uh, Research and Studies is a nonprofit institution. Uh, it's a think tank that focuses on energy and climate. So I don't speak for the Saudi government. Um, but, you know, looking at, you know, what the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait to a certain degree has done in the past, they've maintained the spare capacity. And that spare capacity has been used and it's been a boon for the global economy. And we estimated that at $500 billion of surplus to the, to the global economy because they had the long-term vision of saying that if there is a disruption in demand, if there is, you know, uh, a hiccup in the global oil supply, then there is a way of compensating for that. But we cannot take, you know, energy security and only talk about this from oil supply uh, demand. Um, you know, the old adage which says, you know, if your neighbor lose his or her job, it's a, it's a recession. If you lose your job, it's a depression. And the same goes here. I mean, the, the whole question is, we talk about energy security like it's something new. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, go back 10 years ago when we were talking about energy security and piracy in the Strait of Malacca and the Strait of Bab el um, Seven, eight years ago, we talked about, you know, uh, energy security and cybersecurity. And so we cannot talk about oil supply, uh, you know, as just one component of the energy security. Uh, we need to look at this. Uh, we need to look at, you know, what the discussion has been around, you know, OPEC Plus and OPEC Plus bringing stability into the market um, through the lows and highs. We, we witnessed that back in 2020 um, with the agreement to, you know, reduce su supply when uh, oil went into negative prices. And that's what we want to continue is to look at this, you know, in the long term. Again, you know, if you go back to the 2008 crisis um, uh, and, and the financial crisis and run up to that, the more that I remember, you know, Saudi would announce an increase in supply and the more prices, the prices would go up because, you know, spare capacity would, you know, be dwindling. 
And so the markets need to have a signal around, you know, the stability of the market and that OPEC plus is attending. And I think you can see that with the monthly meeting, with the clear plan that is, you know, not focused on today, but that's focused along, you know, 2022. And that's the agreement that has been done over the past two years. Um, but it, I think, again, you know, we look at this from, you know, what is happening in Saudi with the attacks, what is happening in the UAE. Uh, but also, I think we need to pay attention to energy security, you know, not today, not tomorrow. It's all over, you know. So, um, you know, we spoke about this issue around, you know, the compromise between climate change and energy security. And if you, you know, in the run-up to COP, and I was at Glasgow at that time, nobody would mention energy security. And I think that's, you know, a fallacy. Uh, if you uh, listen to His Royal Highness, uh, the Energy Minister of Saudi Arabia, Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman, has been talking about this three pillar of energy policy that it should focus on energy security, economic growth, and climate change. And we need to keep all three in mind. We're not achieving, you know, our uh, climate goals tomorrow or, or uh, you know, in the next two years. Yet our policy looks like it is, you know, focused on the next two years. And when we're, not, when we're not focusing on emissions, we're focusing on sources and, you know, we don't want nuclear because it's that, we don't want gas because of this, keep oil in the ground. That's, I think, a misleading energy policy. We should be very focused on emissions. We should be very focused on how can we reduce emissions. I mean, shale gas delivered, you know, the biggest reduction in emissions in the U.S. Why are we denying emerging economies the same opportunity? Yeah. Claudio, um, just from the conversations that you've been having since you've been on the ground here uh, in the UAE, can you give us a sense, in your view, if we can expect oil and gas-rich nations to answer President Zelensky's call to do more? And he's essentially saying, echoing the U.S. president, that we should sanction the Russian energy sector and countries like the UAE have a responsibility to flood the market with oil and gas. Do you get a sense that the Gulf states are willing to do that? I'm not a politician. and It's really difficult to run my company if I start also <laughs> thinking for them is too much, honestly. So I think that uh, the UAE and uh, they know, the European politicians, they know what to do. They discuss a lot. We have a concern about uh, gas price. That is big concern because it's, uh, it's too much. As I said, and we are concerned about volumes. And until now, nothing, hap nothing happened in, on the gas side, on the, on the crude side. I think that gas is more uh, crucial and more difficult to be replaced. Clearly, 10 million, if it disappear, 10 million, not all, because uh, to Europe is 5 million. Uh, we can find a way, maybe, to, to, to find some additional oil. For gas, it's more, it's more difficult, honestly. Uh, we, as you and I, we, we start immediately uh, run in all our countries and wor wor working on our upstream. Uh, fortunately, we didn't stop investment in desperation. We have been one of the few companies that never stop investment in desperation. Now we have about uh, 50, 50 TCF of uh, reserves and resources and 14 TCF that can, we can deliver quickly. So I think that for Italy, at, at least we can replace 50% of the gas coming from Russia uh, during the winter 22-23 and about 80% by the next winter 23-24. And in a in couple of years, three years, we can replace completely based on our equity production coming, I said, through pipes and through LNG. That is for, for our country, for our companies. Uh, I don't think that is the same because not all the company has been really uh, engaged in desperation, as we said, because uh, gas was uh, one of the, of the guilty <laughs> person in the room. So I think now this the situation changed, but I don't think that, so we have to look at the energy security from one side, but there is no trade-off with the transition. I think that we have to 
increase in any case our our path and our effort on the transition side. Deputy Assistant Secretary, I want to get your sense of how far the Biden administration is willing to go to help out U.S. producers. And I'm talking about helping them get through red tape. Is the Keystone Pipeline back on the table at some point? If we're realistically talking about doing something to move forward, not lose speed, if you will, or steam towards the energy transition, but at the same point, make sure that people can afford to go about their daily lives. What's on the table that the Biden administration is doing now to help the U.S. oil and gas producers? So from that standpoint, I don't know if you saw the, the U.S.-EU energy statement, joint statement on energy security, and there was a signal very much, and a component of the, the issues that the task force will put together that we'll work on is making sure that Europe can get supply within 2022, but then also giving some certainty to U.S. producers that will be amping up and surging supply into Europe over the long term and up to 2030. And of course, working together on the regulatory side, making sure that the environment for permitting is still there, which has been there. The process has been there to get permits online uh, for LNG, and, and that continues. And we committed to continue to make sure that that is a smooth and streamlined process, and that it's a streamlined process in getting infrastructure that needs to be there for Europe. At the same time, for us, when it comes to the transition and making sure we're not compromising it, because again, we cannot afford to compromise it to the comments that were made that we cannot rely on one technology, just like we cannot rely too heavily on one supply route. Uh, it is the reason that we're putting so much money into hydrogen, which is such a game-changing technology that speaks to a variety of other sources, right? Because it can underpin nuclear, it can underpin gas, it can underpin renewables, it can clean a good portion of it, and so can CCUS. And so for us, it's making sure that the market has enough signals, it knows the regulatory environment will support the signals for current energy security, but we are sending also all the resources we can toward the transition. It's why we're putting billions of dollars into hydrogen R&D, and I have faith we'll get there. And I have faith because I was at Department of Energy when we had dollar a watt goal by 2020 for utility scale solar. We beat that by three years. We didn't even remotely have that level of momentum. So now looking at a dollar per kilogram by 2030 for hydrogen, honestly, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic we can get the commercial technology there and it's going to be the technology that will allow us to utilize other bases. But we have to focus on clean technology. We have to focus on building an efficiency into the system. It can't always be about putting new infrastructure. We talk about often energy access and how countries need sometimes to build new infrastructure. They also have a lot of underutilized infrastructure. And what we don't want is for them to add debt, to add additional gas infrastructure, oil infrastructure, coal infrastructure, when they're not even utilizing what they have. They're underlying issues. And we want to make sure that the path to decarbonization is a realistic path. It's one built in with efficiency. We are focused on emissions, reducing emissions everywhere and creating technology in the U.S. on the R&D side and bringing that cost down so that it benefits everywhere and everyone. And so that's how we're trying to balance that, those signals and, our, and the funding, which is a, big, a really big component of that. No doubt about it. And also it's about messaging. And I'm talking about the demonization of the oil and gas sector. Now, it's hard to feel sorry for IOCs, but at the same point, demonizing them and playing politics is a part of the reason that we're in the mess that we're in today. What will the Biden administration commit to in terms of reaching across to these oil and gas producers? Because the ones I talk to say, we're not getting calls from the White House. We're hearing that we're getting calls, but we actually are not getting calls. And you've got to have them, as Claudia was saying, as a part of the conversation if you want to get out of the mess. There, there have been conversations with oil and gas companies and messaging, and it's, Let's be honest, it depends who you're listening to and when, of course. There, there are a lot of different messages out there, and I'm sure the forum will make a difference. But we will be honest, we have always come out and said oil and gas industry is critical to the transition. They are, they are players in the energy system. They are key players. They are the ones that will be pushing abatement options. They're the ones that will be pushing hydrogen options. And to be quite honest, they're some of the ones that are putting significant investment into clean energy, including renewables. So it has always been, if we do not engage these participants, these critical stakeholders, we will not get to our stakeholder targets. We will not get to methane reduction goals. We will not get to efficiency goals. So the messaging has been oil and gas companies have to be a part of the conversation, but we want them also to be a part of the conversation on the transition. Right. I think the White House might need to take your call on that one. <laughs> Majid, before we let everybody go, you're my guy when it comes to calling oil prices. 
Where do you see oil prices headed at this point? So I think there's been, they're being so driven by uh, geopolitics at the moment that it's impossible to, it's not, it's not normal market dynamics that we're uh, seeing. We were seeing tightness coming out of, of, of uh, COVID, but obviously the conflict in the Ukraine and, and the signaling you're hearing from Western governments is what's driving uh, the market. So I w this time I won't actually uh, uh, make a prediction. I want to echo what uh, Claudio said, I actually praise what Eni's been doing on exploration here in the UAE and Egypt and throughout our region. And I think our industry can play an important role. We ourselves have also 80 TCF of resources and 15 TCF uh, that can be delivered actually in only two fields in the Kurdistan region in, in the north of Iraq. I invite you all to attend the uh, session this afternoon uh, uh, on that. One point I wanted to raise, I'm seeing a lot in the media at the moment that hey, we need to get off uh, Russian uh, oil and gas and move to nuclear and renewables because that will ensure we are politically secure. So I did a little bit of looking into this. So OPEC is 30% of world's production. OPEC plus about 40, 45%. And it's 23 different countries, and they don't even make up a majority of uh, supply. We're honored with uh, Brother Mohammed Barkindo, Secretary General of OPEC here. Nuclear. Russia produces basically all the world's uranium-235 and has half of the world's uranium enrichment. One country, and a country that's controversial to many at the moment. Renewables, China alone, has 85% of rare minerals processing, 90% of all the battery cells produced on Earth, 70% of all the solar panels produced on Earth, and 50% of the wind turbines. One country, China. Again, to the US and, and Europe, a lot of issues around trade and, and geopolitics. So the idea that somehow the energy transition is going to make us immune from geopolitics is a myth that needs to be exploded and recognized now in all our planning. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, sitting on stage with Vladimir Putin back in October, I can tell you that this was a man who fundamentally understood where all of his resources were. He understood exactly how the world was interconnected when it comes to energy, and he understood the European energy dynamic probably better than most of the people even involved in the European energy dynamic, certainly the politicians, and the world, frankly, was sleeping. Panelists, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for your involvement. I'm going to invite Randy to the stage to introduce our next round of guests, and we're going to keep trying not to fall off the stool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adley. Thank you all. Uh, really, really remarkable conversation.